Okay, so a lot of people are struggling with technology and are making mistakes using it. And that's not a small problem. Um, people aren't happy with technology that's not working. And that means they're less effective, they make mistakes, they take longer to do their job. Um, the total cost of ownership goes up and we're facing people, consumers, customers that are not loyal to the technology that we're offering them. So I think you know, a different kind of revolution is in order. And that revolution is about usability. My dream is that five years from now, everybody out there, consumers, people who buy stuff, who actually buy the goods that we're designing and, and building, know how to tell a usable product from an unusable one. And that should become the same kind of everyday knowledge that people just take for granted. Just like today, anybody knows what a flat rate is when they buy a cell phone. You know, it's not impossible. And if there's HDI students here in the room, you won't be learning much new from this you know, talk, but the big goal is to get this out there so people actually understand this. So what I'm gonna try to do is um, tell you a little about, about usability, how I think we could relate this idea to everybody, not just a, the selected few of designers and researchers. So those nine sort of rules that I put together, you know, take them as the 10 commandments of good product design and of good interface design, I think these should become common knowledge. And the first one, obviously, is simplicity. So imagine yourself heading out there buying a new device, a cell phone or you know, a VCR or some piece of software that you're getting online. First thing you should really be asking yourself as a consumer is, is this as simple as it can be? That doesn't mean that it should be too simplistic, you know, not appropriate for what you want to do, but it has to be fit exactly to you as a person with your individual you know, skills and challenges in what you want to do, your particular task that you're trying to accomplish, and your particular context that you're in, you know, where you are, when you are, what you're trying to do. You know, I, I like to refer to the VCR, which is really, the VCR has a sad history, doesn't it? You know, just as it figured out how to do a good user interface on the big screen, it died and TiVo came along. But when you think back to the very early days of the VCR, when it was introduced, it had a button that said record. And that was really cool, right? It was a device that could actually record a show that I wanted to watch later. So people bought VCRs, but then the problem was, of course, everybody had a VCR. And you know, we heard about this earlier today. The problem is then you know, features start creeping into the system. The system becomes more and more complex simply because companies need to sell more and more of these products and next generation products. Um, so in the end, you end up with VCRs. You know, shortly before they died off, you had VCRs that actually had OTR buttons. Anybody remember the OTR button? It's the one touch record. It's like the button that came back that got added to enable the feature that it was originally supposed to be doing in the... It doesn't really make sense, does it? So, um, you know, simplicity is really important. Second thing is Gestalt laws. Let's all go back, um, you know, a couple tens of thousands of years, back in the jungle, and, um, you know, something is jumping you, right? In this case, it's a microwave, right? It's attacking you. What is your brain doing right now? Your brain is amazing. Your eyes and everything that's wired in your brain is really skilled at figuring out what it sees in an instant. You can't even tell that this is going on. So it immediately tells things apart that belong to one block or one object and things that are separate. How does it do that? Well, there's Gestalt laws it got, that are, got figured out by a couple of psychologists in the 30s. For example, stuff that's close together is considered to be belonging together. So we see that in, you know, at work here in this uh, user interface of this uh, microwave, you know, all these buttons down there, they're very close together, closer together than, you know, compared to the rest of the uh, interface. So we see this is a block, this is one object. The next thing is closure, right? Whenever something is enclosed by a line or a block, um, we you know, consider it to be belonging together, like down here. This one says stop cancel, this one says add a minute. So these two buttons got joined together. That makes a lot of sense because they both have to do with the time that this thing runs. These two say defrost and scan. I don't know what a scan button is doing on a microwave, but you know, they're being joined together. I don't think it makes sense in that case, but it looked nice. You know, the designer thought, I gotta bubble down there, I gotta do another one up there. Um, next thing is similarity, right? All these buttons down there from this um, block here um, in the uh, 
number pad. They also look like a number pad because they are all of the same shape. So your brain goes like, da, that's another group of objects, that's one thing. And then the final thing is, you know, the law of experience. So when you see this pad down here, something else is kicking in, which is your brain being really lazy, saying, ah, oh, no, you know, yet another impression that I have to process and figure out what it is. Oh, wait, hey, this looks exactly like that cell phone number pad that I have. So I'm just going to call that a cell phone pad, and I'm going to be done with it and, you know, continue what, I don't know, watching Big Bang Theory or something. So, you know, your brain is really efficient at encoding these things and figuring out what's going on. And if this is done well in a user interface, that totally helps the user to figure out what's going on. So never buy something where, at first glance, things that should be belonging together don't look like they belong together, because you will be struggling with these um, forever, because your brain is just fighting you. So number three, this is a Swedish hair dryer. Uh, I picked this up in a hotel in Sweden, and it looks really cuddly, doesn't it? Really nice. It probably won a design award. And let me tell you, design awards are actually warning labels. <laughs> Stuff that won a design award, more often than not, is totally unusable, but it looks really, really cool. So probably, you know, with this one, it was the same. I picked it up, it's like, oh, that's a nice hair dryer. And then it's like, wait a minute. First of all, how many levels does it have? I don't know. Well, we'd have to guess. Second thing is, how do I turn this thing on? Do I push this button? Do I, you know, turn it? Or do I flip it up and down? Well, I, it took me a while to figure that one out, which shouldn't be necessary, because this is just a frickin' hairdryer, right? Um, so after a while, I figured, oh, I got to push up the button so that I get to the next level. So what this thing is doing wrong, this interface design is wrong, because it's not visible what you can do with this thing. It's not visible what its current state is. You know, right now, if I picked it up, is it on or off? I, I don't know, right? It's really hard to tell. So that's visibility and feedback for you. Um, any good user interface you know, could do a good job at that. Fourth thing, I can stay right with their Swedish hairdryer, is natural mappings. The craziest thing is when you flip this thing to level one, and then you want to go to level two, it's not just pushing the knob further. Oh, no, no, you have to go back all the way to the other end to flip to level two, which is completely insane, right? So the idea of a natural mapping would be to say, if there's anything in the user interface, anything, temperature, um, a rising level of water, um, heat, light, volume, you name it, right? It should always be displayed or controllable in a continuous way from less to more. And ideally, that's from you know, bottom to top or left to right. At least that's true for our um, reading culture here. So not you know, as discontinuous as this one is. Here's my favorite example of that. This is a picture from the Heidelberg Clinic building, the new one. First question, we're in an elevator. How many floors? Yeah, it's not 99, it's not 100, it's two. Second question, which might be even more important, which way is up? You know, 99? Zero, zero? You know, is zero, zero just where the bathroom is? We don't know, right? Um, so I can see what was going on there, right? The guy who was walking up to mount up this you know, elevator probably said, ah, crap, I forgot the number signs um, that you know, are like one and two and stuff like this. Um, but I have these two. And if I add one to 99, it's 100. And then if I drop off the one, it's zero, zero. So that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, to, be, to tell you the truth, zero, zero is the ground floor. 99 is minus one, OK? But go back just two slides, see whether you learned anything. Even if you were that guy mounting this you know, elevator, you'd only had 99 and zero, zero buttons. What could you still have done better to make this elevator easier to use? Yes, yeah, there's the magic movement, right? You do this. Why not just put you know, the zero, zero up here and the 99 down here? Then anybody will say, oh, well, whatever. This is probably up. This is probably down. It's a natural mapping. Plus, if you had changed that, there would have been another beneficial effect that goes back to what I just talked about in Gestalt Loss. So another brain teaser here. What else would you be improving about this interface if you did that? Anything? The two buttons would be closer together. So your brain would go like, oh, that's a group. Right? Whereas now we have this button and this button close together, and this gap is bigger. That's, I don't know what he was you know, smoking that morning when he was installing that elevator. Anyway, that's, so that's natural mappings. 
Then there's the principle of least surprise. Oh, your battery is now fully charged. Have you ever seen anybody giving a talk and that's this thing popping up in the middle of the presentation? That's so wrong, right? That, or, or our other favorite, right? I'm clippy. You know? If you ever want to create um, you know, a positive connection to the audience, just show Clippy. Everybody hates them. Say you hate them, you're good, okay? Um, what people say is that computers are going to become more like humans, right? Now, this kind of behavior is like a human, but to me, it's like an obnoxious little child that says, Mommy, right here, you know, I'm done. Help me get off the toilet or something. So it's like... It wants attention now, and it's in your face, it's the wrong time, and it's just annoying, right? If my computer was ever to be like a human person, I would like it to be like a butler, who would be standing off there to the side, you know, quietly when the battery is fully charged, and then as I walk off the stage, you'd say, <clears throat> Professor Borges, by the way, your battery is now fully charged. Um, so, you know, that's what you would... You don't want interfaces to surprise you. Surprise is great in a video game, but when I'm using an interface, to get something done, I don't want too many surprises, right? That's not good. By the way, it's also a bad idea to use timeouts ever in an interface. Whenever you pick an, uh, something up and it says, you know, do function A by pressing this button briefly, do function B by pressing this button a little longer, and do function 3 by pressing this button 3.78 seconds, not a good idea, right? These are always hard to use. The, uh, the timeouts are either too long or too short. You remember those you know, crazy one-hand turns you took on the road because your car was going through its auto search of its radio station, and the radio station you wanted came up right at that moment when you had to take that turn, so, you know, you risked your life to stop the radio to, from moving on. That's bad because it's a timeout. So number six, dialogues, not monologues. You know, this is a TomTom -tom interface for a NAVSAT, and I love it. Because once you've picked out where you want to go, it has these choices. It says, you know, there's a roadblock, like, you know, I don't know, 100 meters down, there's a block in the road that, you know, the system doesn't know about. Um, just find me a different route. Or you could say, oh, you know, on my trip from Aachen to Hostel, I want to visit my mom and, you know, take me via, you know, some other place en route. Or I could say, um, you know, the route you chose takes me by the, you know, I don't know, the, the, the youth the youth prison, and I have bad memories of that place. So just find me a different route, you know, that's also possible. Or my favorite is, just get me something else. You can actually say that, just get me something else, and it will take the route that, you know, is like 10 seconds short, longer, but is so much easier to drive. So this is a system that doesn't just come up with a solution and it says, take it or leave it. It actually lets you enter a dialogue with it to figure out where you want to go. That's much more like a human sitting next to you where you say, oh, could we take a detour via that? And say, yeah, sure, I'll find a new route. So that's a good system. And then, there, of course, there's error tolerance, right? Um, that's one of my favorite mistakes, you know, error messages that I recently got from my, my Mac. Uh, and it's clear what happened here because the operation could not be completed. Could is in capitals because it's important. And in case you still don't know what was going on, the message is client error not possible, right? So I'm guessing it has something to do with printing, but um, you know, just because of that icon there. So that's not very helpful, right? If there is a mistake, the system should help you to get out of that situation as quickly as possible. Because how, you know how people always say, we want to build computers that can sense human emotion, right? Big research grants and stuff. It's so easy, I can tell you, anytime the, the computer creates an error message, I can tell you what the emotion the user is feeling right now, very precisely, right? Why not use that? So number eight is vertical design. There is something strange, or maybe it's not so strange. Um, it's actually pretty obvious, but people, I don't think people have figured it out yet. Um, if you take these devices, there's a MacBook Air, there's an iPhone, and there's that TomTom -tom device, just as a representative, of a group of products, interactive systems, that work really well, that get the interface right. You know, most of the time. They have their problems, but most of the time they get it surprisingly well. They build a lot of customer loyalty. And then I'm going to show you some other group of products. You know, these are, or I should probably say were, Symbian smartphones. Um, there's the Android platform, and there is a, a Windows laptop. Not quite the same amount of sort of customer brand loyalty and, and sort of 
you know, heralded ease of use and design value in that second group. Now, what's the key difference in the approach of how these systems are being designed and built between the left-hand group and the right-hand group? The title kind of gives it away, right? The left-hand side, everything happens under one roof. Apple makes its hardware, you know, it makes its operating system, it makes its key central applications, it even makes its user interface, and it doesn't even let the operators, in the case of the iPhone, get on there and put, you know, big pink buttons anywhere they feel like it. Right? So it controls everything. So the guy who's designing the case can walk over to the guy who's designing the UI and say, look, I'm trying to place the mute button really well. What is a good place to do that? And how should it work so that you, know, you can display the results in the user interface? They can all work together. This is really hard for companies like Microsoft or Google with Android because they are doing a, a horizontal approach. Right? They are only designing one layer. The hardware comes from HTC. Um, you know, the uh, operating system comes from Google or somewhere else. You know, and then there is yet another brand that uh, creates the key applications and maybe even an operator that puts on a branding thing. So there is something about vertical design that makes it easier to build truly useful products. Well, and the final one is aesthetics. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to riff too much on this, but it is definitely a challenge um, to use a product if it's really designed badly. And I have seen enough user interfaces that have been designed by engineers, because I've been training engineers in HCI for about 10 years now, uh, probably a little more. And engineers have this idea of color, for example, that is, there are only three colors in the world. One is full red, one is full green, and one is full blue, right? 25500, that's a real color. Nothing else counts. And, and if you see, you get, you get interfaces that look like, you know, cheap supermarket ads when you, when you take that approach. So it's not a good idea to have engineers design user interfaces, both from a visual aesthetic point of view, but also because engineers are fundamentally thinking differently. Um, they look for all the potential use cases and they try to integrate them all and make the interface usually much too complex rather than leaving out the stuff that isn't as essential and thereby making it easier to use. Um, but, you know, what's wrong about uh, engineers designing interfaces is a topic of a whole other talk. For now, these nine rules, I ask you to join me and start a revolution by telling everybody about it. I think these are simple enough for everybody to pick up. And for a few years from now, you will have people no longer walking down the aisles of Media Markt and the likes, like zombies, only checking for the price tag and the list of features, but actually looking for whether these things are usable technology for them or not. Thank you very much.